The Trona Railway was built in 1913 and 1914 to connect mineral-rich Searles Lake with the Southern Pacific Lone Pine Branch. Owned by the American Trona Company, the Trona was still heavily influenced by the SP. Their first locomotives, a pair of oil-fired 280s delivered by Baldwin in January 1914, were copies of SP's C9 consolidations. The Trona was a well-built railroad, but there was one fact of life that no amount of engineering could fix. The loaded trains have to move uphill out of the Searles Valley to reach the SP connection. The railroad is relatively flat for the first eight miles out of Trona. After that, it's a 1.75% grade most of the way to Searles Station. This hill put the 280s to the test, and today it still challenges EMDs. Business steadily grew as the processing facilities at Trona expanded. The two consolidations were overworked, so in January 1937, the Trona purchased a former Union Pacific 282 from the Six Companies, the contractor that built the Boulder Dam. Built by Elko Schenectady in January 1914, the same month as the Trona's 280s, number 2701 retained her original UP number. World War II created even more demand for the products of Trona. By 1945, the Trona's three steamers were just about worn out, but the Trona's traffic continued to grow. The railroad decided to buy diesels, and they turned again to Baldwin, purchasing a pair of DT-66-2000 center cabs in April 1949. The Trona center cabs were the only DT-66-2000s built with MU controls. They also incorporated Mars lights on both ends and an automatic speed control system that sounded an alarm and set the brakes if the unit exceeded a certain speed. Curiously, in spite of the hill they would face every day, the center cabs were not equipped with dynamic brakes. We've gone to a lot of trouble to why our locomotives for an engineer who didn't like to work backwards, he said. He liked to have the short nose forward. And we've had others who liked to work backwards. They wanted the long nose forward so they'd know what was behind them, you know. But with those center cabs, the question became moot, you know. Everything was the same on both ends. And uh, I think that was a definite plus, but they were just ideal for switching or yard locomotives or mainline long-haul road engines either, and they served in both capacities all over the country. The new Baldwins proved enormously successful on the Trona, and they quickly spelled doom for the Baldwin steamers. Number one was retired in 1950, and number two followed her to the torch in 1951. In 1953, the Trona decided to dieselize completely by ordering an AS-616, Trona 52 arrived in March 1954, and 282-2701 was retired later that year. The 52 was delivered with dynamic brakes, and after using her on the hill, the Trona quickly decided to have the center cabs retrofitted with dynamics. Business continued to improve, and in 1960, the Trona determined that they needed another unit. Unfortunately, Baldwin had been out of the business since 1956, so the Southern Pacific agreed to sell the Trona a nine-year-old AS-616, number 5249, which became Trona 53. In 1964, the Trona acquired another center cab, a General Electric 80-tonner from the U.S. Navy, number 65-00297, which worked briefly as Trona 49 before it was sold to Kermagee as the Trona plant switcher. The four Baldwins toiled throughout the 1960s, never leaving their 31 miles of railroad. Our railroad has always been considered to be built backwards. The outbound payloads go uphill at an average 2% grade, and the inbound empties come downhill. And when I came to work here, the big center cabs and our two eight-cylinders, both that pull the outbound trains in different configurations of consist, uh, pull those up the hill and I've had engineers tell me that on daylight runs they'd be pulling the maximum tonnage and they couldn't look ahead at the horizon or down the track until they were moving. They'd have to look down at the pilot right by the wheels to see if they were actually moving. 
And those big wheels and those extra teeth in the bull gear would keep those ball ones moving instead of bogging down and stopping or, or getting wheel slip. They'd be moving so slow, but they'd just keep going until they got over the steepest part and level out, and then they'd uh, push her up another notch and they'd take off again. And... But as the 1970s wore on, the years and the hill were taking their toll. As more and more Baldwins were being retired across the country, the cost and the trouble of obtaining Baldwin parts was starting to grow. In 1973, the Trona reacted by leasing SP power for the run from Searles Station to Trona. This enabled them to sell the center cabs and restrict the AS-616s to switching duties. They worked. They had a lot of power. and They did the job they were supposed to do. We had engineers that were so attracted to them that we had one fellow who retired shortly after we sold them. Uh, he was old enough, but uh, I knew him well, and I, I'm uh, positive he had no plans to retire until he learned that the Toronto Railway was selling those center cabs, which happened all at once. And I don't think O'Al was ever the same after that. He just decided to retire, and he left. The two center cabs were sold to Peabody Coal Company in 1973 and put to work in a coal mine at, of all places, Baldwin, Illinois. But their new careers were short. Peabody retired the center cabs in 1977 and sold them for scrap. Baldwin's had almost disappeared from the American Railroad scene by 1980, and by all rights, this should have been the declining days for the Trona's pair. But it was not to be. When ITT Rainier shut down their logging operation in Grays Harbor, Washington, Trona purchased their AS-616 No. 14, which became Trona 54. With the new unit came a generous inventory of Baldwin spare parts, including a main generator and a freshly rebuilt prime mover. The 54 introduced a brilliant new silver and red paint scheme that was quickly applied to the other two units. As the 1990s approached, the three AS-616s were still hard at work, with retirement still not in sight. The name Baldwin has meant locomotives almost since the birth of railroading. Matthias Baldwin, born in 1795, was a talented inventor who built his first full-size steam locomotive in 1832, Old Ironsides, for the Philadelphia, Germantown and Norristown Railroad Company. Matthias Baldwin died in 1866, but his Baldwin locomotive works grew with the expanding railroad industry. Baldwin ultimately built over 60,000 steamers, which saw service all over the world. Baldwin pioneered many innovations in steam locomotion. They also built many electric locomotives as a partner with Westinghouse Electric Company. And in 1925, the partnership constructed a 1,000 horsepower A1A A1A oil electric numbered for its builder's number 58501. Baldwin continued to experiment with the diesel, but they did not introduce their first production models until 1939. Two switchers numbered for their horsepower the VO660 and VO1000. By this time, competition in the diesel market was heating up. Late in 1939, Electromotive Corporation, a subsidiary of General Motors, would send their FT demonstrator set number 103 on a cross-country tour that would change American railroading forever. The fate of the steam locomotive was sealed by the time 103 returned to its birthplace at LaGrange, Illinois, 11 months later. Baldwin, still firmly committed to steam, had two serious competitors for the diesel market, the partnership of Alco and General Electric and the upstart EMC. 
Despite Baldwin's pioneering efforts at diesel locomotion, they would have to play catch-up. They reacted with several innovative designs. One was a failure, one was a curiosity, and one would help change the face of American railroading. At the request of the Columbus and Greenville Railway in Mississippi, Baldwin designed and built the first 1500 horsepower road switcher in America. Delivered in October 1946, CNG number 601 employed a turbocharged 8-cylinder De Laverne prime mover which powered Westinghouse electrical equipment. To spread its weight over the CNG spindly track, the 601 and its four companion units rode on A1A, A1A trucks. The new model was designated DRS 64 1500 for diesel road switcher, six axles, four motors, 1500 horsepower. Significantly, the new unit borrowed the road switcher concept of Alco GE's pre-war RS1, but in a higher horsepower package. With good visibility front and rear and ready access to the machinery, the road switcher concept would be borrowed back by Elko GE and copied by all the other builders. The sleek covered wagons would disappear from the erector's bay in 1960, vanquished by the road switcher. Baldwin designed the new unit to ride on BB, A1A, A1A, or CC trucks, effectively making three locomotives out of one. The first BB version, Western Maryland 170, entered service in July 1947. In February 1948, Baldwin pioneered the first six-motor road switcher, Chicago and Northwestern 1500. The DRS 66 1500 was three years ahead of its competition, the Alco GE RSD4 and Fairbanks Morris H1666 and four years ahead of EMD's SD7. But the competition wasn't far behind. Elko GE introduced their RS2 and RSC2 shortly after CNG 601 was delivered, and FM entered the road switcher market in 1947 with their H1544 and H2044. In 1948, EMD made an abortive stab at the market with their BL2. <laughs> A year later, they introduced the GP7, which would ultimately dominate the road switcher market. Baldwin, whose sales lagged behind the competition before the war, found themselves losing more ground. In 1950, they introduced a new line of road switchers boasting 100 more horsepower. Again, the units came in three wheel arrangements, the BB AS16, the A1A A1A AS416, and the CC AS616. All three units employed Baldwin's 608A engine, a descendant of the De Laverne VO engine the first diesel engine designed from the bed plate up for locomotives. The De Laverne was a solid, conservatively designed four-stroke engine. Always built as an inline engine, either six or eight cylinders, its production version had a 12 and three-quarter inch bore, 15 and a half inch stroke, and turned over at a leisurely 625 RPM. At 1,979 cubic inches per cylinder, the De Laverne had the largest cylinders of any production locomotive engine in North America, but it generally had fewer of them. The 608A was a turbocharged 8-cylinder engine that churned out 1,600 horsepower. It drove a Westinghouse 471 main generator, which powered Model 370 traction motors. The standard gear ratio was 1563 and an optional 1568 ratio was available. 
The new units gained a reputation as solid workhorses, but Baldwin fell farther and farther behind the competition in sales. By the early 1950s, dieselization of American railroads was almost complete. The diesel was now a well understood machine, and one thing the railroads understood was the difficulty of maintaining three or four makes of diesels. The railroads began an attempt to standardize their rosters, and in most cases this meant standardizing on EMDs and ELCO GEs. The AS-616 would prove to be Baldwin's most popular heavy road switcher, selling 222 units between 1950 and 1954. Baldwin also built 111 AS-16s and 25 AS-416s for a total of 358 heavy road switchers. But they were left with only a sliver of the diesel market. In the same time frame, EMD sold 188 SD7s and 2,729 GP7s. Baldwin delivered their last diesel electric in 1956, ending an illustrious 124 year history of locomotive production. Despite being orphaned, many Baldwins enjoyed long service careers. Baldwins did not become rare until well into the 1960s when second-generation road switchers from EMD and GE had replaced much of Baldwin's first-generation competitors as well. The ranks of Baldwins thinned throughout the 1970s and 80s, and by 1988, fewer than 100 Baldwins were operating in the U.S. The Trona's three AS-616s were the only six-motor Baldwins in service. But 1989 was a renaissance year of sorts. In October of that year, Magma, Arizona put their DRS-66-1500 No. 10 back in service after a five-year storage. The history book hadn't closed on Baldwin just yet. 